Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. This happened uh, a few years ago when I walked into a church that had asked me to come and be there. And then, back then you called it interim pastor. Now we call it transitional pastor. And uh, I, I, one of the very first things that I did was I sat down with a group and I said, tell me what it is that, that you think will happen and tell me what you want to happen. Maybe two different things. And the very first thing was uh, uh, an older lady who stood up and she, and she was in tears and she just simply said, I'd like to have my church back. Mm. This is Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. I'm Dan Hurst. There's Mark Halleck sitting over there. And boy, today we're talking about churches that are really, really hurting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are many who are. You know, we see the closure in Southern Baptist life of 800 churches a year that cease to exist in one way or another. 800. Many of them, most of them, I should say, the vast majority are in communities that still need the gospel. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. not towns that are, you know, are no longer existing. That's a very small number. As many as 70% of these churches that close are in communities of over 100,000 people. Wow. So we have churches that are dying where we need churches. Some of you listening are in a church that's dying. In other words, if it continues on its current trajectory, you'll be underwater in four or five years. I mean, you, you keep losing members and, and, and income at, at the rate you're losing and not gaining anything, and, and you're going to be – I mean, it's true. At any given time, there's about 4,000 Southern Baptist churches that are within five years of closure. Wow. So if you're in that ballpark or you know someone who is – this is a podcast you need to listen to, because how do you get them to acknowledge we are in deep, deep trouble, and we're going to have to make some drastic changes, probably meaning we're going to have to partner with somebody else to get us out of this mess? How do we get to there? Because they're in such denial that this is happening, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and they don't want to face the reality. It is a lot like when your aged parents can no longer live alone. Mm. And you have this conversation with them. You've already taken the car away, maybe. And now you say, Dad, Mom, you can't live alone, you know, because you fall. You, well, oh, we'll be fine. Oh, we can make it. And, and you, you, how do you get them to understand the reality of the desperateness of their situation? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're going to talk about mm. on this episode of Revitalize and Replant. Mark, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when we talk about how to do that? Yeah, the first thing is this, is we need to help get them to turn that pain that they're feeling, which is real pain, into a greater passion for prayer. And what I would say about that is, listen, at the end of the day, we declare our desperation for God to move when we're on our knees. Mm. That's the bottom line. And so I think sometimes when it comes to revitalization, we're so quick to talk about methods and new strategies. And and those are all fine. But but what we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to bring... Not only us back to life, but this church back to life and give us fresh vision. We're desperate for God, and that's why prayer is everything. And, Pastor, you you can go to these people and say, hey, we got to talk to the state convention and the association about being replanted and some church coming in and partner with us or some new church. And they're just going to – their heads – they're just – their their heads going to explode. You go, why, why? But if you say, you know what, we've got some struggles here. We're we're down numerically, and financially we're hurting. You all agree, yes. I'll tell you what, let's – can we agree to just spend some specific focused time the next six months praying about that? They are not going to say, no, we're not, mm-hmm, all right? Mm-hmm. They're not going to argue with you about whether they should pray or not. Yeah. So start with something they agree with, and prayer is incredibly important. And so get them to be in, in concerted. And in this prayer time, this prayer season, mm-hmm. lead them to see some realities about their neighborhood, yeah. about their church, about its future, be grateful for its past. But I mean, take that pain and angst that they're feeling about the future and turn it into a greater passion for prayer Yeah, and be patient with that. Yeah. I mean, here's the truth. What are you going to build your church on? I mean, as a leader, what I would say is this, if it's not prayer, it's going to be the wrong thing because your ideas, that's great. What prayer does is, and part of it is you may have a, have folks, when I came to Calvary, intellectually, they understood the importance of prayer. There's no question. They have good doctrine. But to warm their hearts and help cast vision for, do you know how important this is? If you're not passionate about prayer as a leader, your people will never be. 
And they see that on Sunday morning see with the way you pray yeah. publicly. How do you pray? Do you prioritize it? Even And I would even say this. You start a prayer meeting, and if it's you and one other person, then do it. Yeah, that's right. What does that say? It's a statement you're making. Part of it is an integrity issue of going before the Lord. Lord, who am I to think that I can lead this church back to life apart from you? Right. If nothing else, you're saying, Lord, we're desperate for you. Right. And that will spread in time to your people. And in praying, you will help them realize the needs in the neighborhood. Mm. Oh, this is a great point. Because so go ahead. when you discover, when your people discover it, when they move, and this is a litmus test, when you're praying and you've noticed that they've stopped praying about the church and start praying for the church, right. mm. the only that says that they understand that there's a reason and a purpose for the church. Mm. And that takes us to what is the ministry of the church. And mm, even, even look, even have them maybe go to different parts of the neighborhood with you and, and at a park, for example, and just stay, let's just get out here and let's just all pray for the kids who come to this park every day. That's a great Or idea. let's go to this, uh, let's go to the, the fire station and let's sort of, let's still make a big issue out of it, but let's just kind of stand here and pray for the first responders and what they do. Get them out of the building, mm-hmm. help them, st- of course, go to the school, say across the street from the yep. school, we're going to pray for our schools. Get them out of the building, help them start praying for the community. So number one, help them, help them pray for their church. Number two, help them pray for the community. And then number three, encourage them to pray for themselves. Mm. You know, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he never asked anybody to pray by name for any of the Roman guards. Mm. He asked people to pray for him that he would be good and bold in his witness. I'm not telling you you shouldn't pray for the lost by name, but you should pray for yourself to be bold in your witness. Mm -hmm. So take about several months and get them to begin to pray for their church, pray for their community, and pray for themselves to be bold in their witness. Mm. Dan, I would even suggest, if you've not had anybody baptized there for months or a year or two, fill up that baptistry some Sunday morning. Mm. At the end of the service, go step in that baptistry full of water, put your hands in the water, lift it up, and say, would you all, there's 10, 20, 30 of you here, would you all come up here as close as you can to the front, and would you pray with me Mm. that we will see this baptistry used again someday? Mm. Take them to the nursery. On a Wednesday night, if you meet in prayer meeting on Wednesday night, ask the church, say, let's, let's go down to the old nursery. Nobody's been in that nursery for, for, for years, but let's stand here and let's pray over this nursery that God will bring children here. Begin to use their pain as a passion for prayer and let's see what God would do. What's number two, Mark? Okay, number two is find the intersection of members' passions, their gifts, and the community needs. And they've discovered those community needs in the prayer in t- that you've been prayer, doing. In prayer, that's right. And when you get them to start not trying to grow the church, mm. but to serve the community, wow, yeah. they begin to think outwardly. And what you're going to do there is you're going to help them realize there's a lot of needs we can't meet. That's right. And so that's when they're going to begin to be open to other people coming along and helping them. And that's really important to know. So, But they, there's, needs they, there's needs they can meet. And here's one of the ways you can do that. Find some nonprofits in your neighborhood, in your community that have people that need to volunteer and get your people to volunteer at those non. Maybe they need – maybe they put uh, uh, backpacks of school supplies mm-hmm. together. Your people can do that. Maybe they pack food for homeless. Your people can do that. What is it your people can do yeah. right now to start serving the community? Even though there may just be a handful of them and the church may be dying, that doesn't matter. Find some way to get their passion. Yeah, what do they good. like to do? Do they like to garden? Is there some way you could be creative enough to to go to your mm-hmm. school, your middle school or something and say, I've got this lady who does this great thing with, with daylilies. Is there any way maybe she could come and talk to you, one of your science classes about daylilies? Be creative and find some way to get them to use their passion to connect to the community. Because isn't, be, it, is, yeah. isn't it interesting how it's so good, and I know you experienced this at Warnell, I know we've experienced this at Calvary, is as your people begin to use their gifts and serve the community, they fall in love with the community. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, they quit looking at themselves yeah. and they quit yeah. turning inward. And again, don't say we're doing this to grow the church. Right. Because yeah. oftentimes, initially, it will not. It's not, yeah, exactly. It's not about getting more people in the pews. It's about getting the people in the pews into the lives of the people in the mm-hmm. community. So find ways to well, – first, got to know what their passions are. It, we, we'll put these in the show notes. These came from Tom Rayner, by the way. But we'll put these in the show notes. Find the intersections of the members' passions. Well, you're not going to know their passions until you spend time with them mm-hmm. and their gifts. And then the community needs. It's your job to connect those things together, yeah. to connect those dots. Number three is what, Mark? Celebrate more often. 
We need to celebrate a ton. Celebrate everything. Celebrate everything. One of the the things that we have in the Calvary family is every win is a big win. Mm -hmm. Every what I mean by that is every conversation, every little work of God's grace. Your people, you want to lift that up. You want to celebrate it. You want to praise God for it. It gives people hope. It gives them encouragement. And you've got to lead the way in that. I mean, you've got to celebrate. There's so much to celebrate, even in a dying church where it's like, well, look at us. Yeah, look at what's going on. Look at what the Lord's doing. We have got to be people of hope. And yes. even in a dying church, we know that God raises the dead. Yeah. So we have hope Amen. that he will That's resurrect right. this place. And you've got to express that hope. Yep. So here's what you can celebrate in a dying church. Anything going on in those people's life. They got a grandkid yep. that does something great in school. Celebrate that. Yep. They, they, they have a 65th wedding anniversary. Blow the roof off that. That's that is great. Bring them up there. Right, celebrate right. that. You know, if, if, um, if, if Thelma wins the daylily contest at the county fair, celebrate that. Let mm. her bring her daylily to church and show it off. Be a happy place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Celebrate yeah, yeah. it. Yep. And then find ways to celebrate things that are happening elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, get online. Look at what God's doing through the IMB and through the North American Mission Board and your state convention, some of your collegiate ministries, and pull those stories out and say, today, you know, at the university down the street, Southern Baptists are doing this work, and I want to show you some pictures of what's mm-hmm. going on now. Can mm-hmm. we just celebrate that God's doing some yes. great things? Because yes. that's who we are. Yep. Every week, start yep. celebrating something, and you'll begin to change their attitude. But I've been in so many churches yeah. that are dying, and it's just like, oh, man, it is a cold, mm, dead place. Yeah, yeah. And they're not celebrating anything. And there's yeah. so much we can celebrate. Yeah. So celebrate often. And maybe practically, literally, just find a, a moment in your worship service from early on. We just called it the mission moment. Okay. And it could be anything. But what is it? It's a chance to celebrate a win every week. It could be as simple as... You know, we took a group of folks, we went that on that prayer walk, and we had three of us show up, and we prayed for that school, and wasn't that a joy that we were over there? And I mean, you've got you've to be, as a leader, you've got to identify those and raise them up and praise God for those things. Right. Make it a happy place Make there. it a happy I love on, that. On Make it a happy place. And you know, on a, again, when I was at Warnell, I was going around a little neighborhood where we were there and shopping in the shops and checking out the restaurants, and... I walked into this one restaurant that hadn't been there for very long, and I was just going to say hey to the guy, and there wasn't anybody in there. And he was on the phone, actually, to the uh, to the county uh, assessor, <laughs> and he was behind in his property taxes. And he was like, well, I can't stay in business if you do this to me. And he was, and he hung up the phone real quick, and he goes, can I help you? And I thought, well, I ought to buy something now. So <laughs> I, I was the only one there. I said, yeah, give me a menu. So I, I ordered some food. And he said, I'm sorry you had to hear that. And I said, that's okay. He said, this business is not going well. He said, my mm-hmm. wife and I thought it was going to be really great. And he told me all the problems they were having. Basically, he was in the near a, a senior adult housing place. And he thought all these senior adults would uh, would use his mm-hmm. restaurant. He mm-hmm. said, they do, but they nickel and dime me to death. <laughs> he said, I had a lady come in here. He said, this is true, Mark. He said, we sell cookies for like two bucks a piece. She wanted to have a cookie. <laughs> he said, I just felt like I'm not staying here any longer. <laughs> And he was really frustrated. And I said, look, man, I said, I'm the pastor of this church across the street. I said, I feel your pain. I said, we got about 30 people in the sanctuary. It seats about 600, and we're struggling too. But uh, I said, if you'll give me this menu, I'll make a photocopy of it, and I'll pass it out Sunday morning to everybody in our church. Mm. And he said, well, how much is that going to cost me? And he was dead serious. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to cost you anything. Yeah. And he said, "Well, I'm a." He was. He said, "I'm." And he said, "I'm a member of my Catholic parish." He mm-hmm. said, "I asked the the priest there if we could put it in the newsletter, and he wanted like three hundred bucks." And I said, "No, we." I said, "Well, first of all, we only got thirty people, so <laughs> and some of them, one of them may be the person who wanted half the cookie, so you know, I don't know." But I said, "We'll we'll do what we can do." And so we I, the next Sunday, I went over there and I said, "I want you guys to go eat at his restaurant sometime this week. Just get mm-hmm. something." And so many of them did. And then I called my director of missions, and I said, I need 100 bucks because we didn't have any money in our church. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have any money, man, love you on your director of missions And if you're a Southern Baptist. And that guy was gracious, and he gave us 100 bucks. So I went over to the restaurant, and I said, bro, I want you to put $100 worth of, like, breakfast, bu- breakfast breads together, whatever treats you can do. And next Sunday, I want you and your wife to show up at our church, and we're going to serve everybody – your, your breakfast food. Oh, he said, I don't, he, I don't know about that. I've never been in a Baptist church. And I said, we're not going to hurt you or anything. And <laughs> it took two or three weeks, but eventually they agreed. 
So they came. We put all the food at the back. And again, we've got 30 people here, mm-hmm. right? Put all the food at the back. And so uh, we had to do a little greeting on Sunday morning, sing a song or two. And I say, hey, there's a neighbor across the street. He's got a restaurant, and he brought some food for us today. Let's all take a break and, and have some and share it. So we all ate it. And then I did freak him out. I said, I'm just going to come up here. So he came up to front with his wife. And me and, and one, of my, one of the only other, yeah. like, deacon I had, uh, we prayed for the success mm-hmm. of their business. And, uh, man, they stood there and wept and wow. cried. And wow. Now, the business still went out of business. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. but, but, but we made a good friend, right? Yeah. And, and it, got, it got the word in the community. And that little church of 30 felt like mm. there's something to celebrate. Yeah, yeah. We can love people. Yes. And I just – don't, don't underestimate right. what you can do by just loving your community. Mm-hmm. And those older people in that church at Warnell, they were, like, amazed that our church could have mm. that kind of impact on something. So that's a long story, but it's my podcast. That's amazing. So, I love anyway, it. Anyway. <laughs> let's uh, go to number four. Yeah, go to number four. Number four. That's great. Well, let's, uh, let me go back. Number okay. one was get yep. them to turn your yep. greater passion of, of dying into pain. Get the greater – You got Get this. them to you turn this. that pain into a greater passion for prayer. All right? Number two, find that intersection of the members' passions and gifts and community needs. And then number three, as we just said, celebrate more often. So number okay, four – here's four, and I wa- I'm so curious to hear you yeah. talk about this. Get, number four, go ahead. Get them to remember the past to propel them to the future. Yes. Let them know that just the same God who worked here in the past and did these great things is the same God who can do it tomorrow. Mm. And and let them share with you the great victories of that church in the past. Amen. When did when did you have some great times? What were some of the fantastic things that is God any different today than he was? The community's different, sure. The world's different, sure, but God's not. God's not not different. And how can we build on those things? Not ignore them, not act Mm -hmm. like they weren't there, but celebrate them, even to the point that you you can have a history Sunday where you celebrate the history of the church. You can pull some of the pictures out and put them up and and talk about the the big Mm -hmm. BBS we used to have or the big youth choir tour we had or or all the things we used to do. And let them remember that Mm -hmm. and not long for the past, but realize that is still possible today. Mm -hmm. And so you're not devaluing the past. You're really embracing it in a very real way, and that can help propel them to the future. So, by, by the way, I, I, one time in a little church, I was there's a little rural church that I was working with, and uh, I went in and I said, Let, "You know what? They they've been around for I don't know 50, 60 years, seventy five years, and uh, they were bemoaning that the church just you know everybody moved away." And I said, what are you talking about? People are moving into this area. What do you mean that everybody's moved away? I said, let's do something. Let's, let's find out. If we can find out the direction of the church, we can find out where the church is going. And uh, by that I mean find out what direction we've been going for the past several years. Let's build a timeline of the church. There you go. And we put up a, a rope and uh, mm. on a wall. Mm. And I said, here's what I want you to do. And I gave them all pieces of paper and everything. I said, I want you to write down something that really significant in the life of this church, I something that. that really, really wow. happened that, that you thought was awesome. Mm. And let's give it a date. We need to know when that happened. Then we went and used clothespins and put Perfect. it on up there. And they looked at that thing. Mm. And I said, now, I want you to notice something. Before every time that the church had a great time, we had a pretty miserable time. Oh, that's awesome. Wow, that's good. And and it was just like, oh, that's that's, that's our direction. Yes, that's good. Yes. That's where we're going. Oh, that's so good, Hurst. Man, that's awesome. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Remember the past to propel them to the future. So when you do those four things, right? Number one, you get them to turn that pain into a passion for prayer. Number two, you get the members to use their passions to serve the community. Number three, you celebrate everything and become a celebratory church. Number four, you remember the great victories of the past to propel them to the future. Then and only then, I think, you help them to consider what could our future look like. Yeah, and this is number five, to get them to consider a replant. Right. And why is it that that these first four things precede number five? To get their hearts right, to get Mm. their attitudes right, to deal with all their objections ahead of time. Now, they're still going to have objections, but you will have have turned over a lot of soil— removed a lot of rocks, you've cleared a lot of land in their hearts to get them to place that when you say, we may need to be adopted by a younger church, we may need to be adopted by a larger church, we may need to ask three or four churches to come alongside us and help us move to the future and make some drastic changes, you're helping them understand why we need mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a, a lengthy process, and it, it can take a lot of... And listen, it... <laughs> Sometimes you, you, you have to do it, and they say no, and you just wait. 
and you go back to number one all over again. And you get down and they say no and you wait and you go back to number one all over again. But maybe after the third or about the third or fourth cycle, maybe after three or four years, they'll say, you know what you've been talking about. I, I think we need to probably do that. And I think that's the tactical patience yeah, we're talking right. about and that's loving good. them. But if you'll continue to do these four things we have on this list, mm-hmm. I really believe the Holy Spirit will, if they're truly regenerate, mm-hmm. he'll move in their heart Amen. to the place that they're willing to lay down their preferences because they'll want to reach the community. Yes. Prayer will, will open their eyes to what God can do. The, the celebratory times, and we'll, they'll see there's so much more we could do and all mm-hmm. of that kind of stuff. So it's really important that we deal with the pain of a dying church yeah before we ask them to make the change necessary. Amen. All right? Well said. All well right, said. here we go. Well, there you, there you have it. How do you deal with the pain of a dying church? And it obviously starts with understanding what the pain is and then, uh, and then learning how to heal uh, beyond that. So I, I hope that's been a, a blessing to you. It's, uh, it's certainly a blessing to us. You know, we always get something out of these things. I love, you know, going back and listening. I'm like, oh, man, I missed that. You know, yeah, the Alex yeah, said that yeah, and, yeah. and Clifton said that. And I was like, wow, that was, that's really good. I can, oh. I can take that and apply it in my life. Mm. We hope that that's, uh, that that's the way it is for you also. Uh, join us again. Our next episode is coming up in Oh, just look at the hours. 48 you hours. Just, just count down the clock right now. <laughs> it's just, you can't wait. I, I just, I, by the way, we are at the North American Mission Board right now. We take this thing on the road, right? We I take, was going to say, this is a, we've done a couple episodes right, here Right. We take the white couch with the us white where, couch, wherever everywhere we, we go. go. And uh, we've been to Denver. We've been to New Orleans. We've been to Kansas City. And now we are here in Alpharetta, Metro Atlanta. We're here at the at the NAM headquarters. We, we, now wait, we don't have the white couch in the podcast booth here. For one thing, we couldn't get it up. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually on the lawn in front <laughs> of NAM. So it you, has you a sign on it that says "free." If you drive by, nobody's taking it yet. All right, you take care. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.